Welcome to Women of Culture. I'm Meera T. Sundararajan. Join me and my distinguished guests to discover untold stories from the world of culture. Indians are known for their love of color, and nowhere is this more apparent than in the variety of colorful garments worn by Indian women. The sari, in particular, is an Indian cultural icon, six yards of cloth featuring every type of woven material from cotton to silk, linen to nylon, richly decorated in a seemingly infinite variety of patterns, both traditional and innovative, and in its fancier iterations, featuring spectacular embroidery in gold and sometimes silver thread, known as zari or jerihe in Tamil. In spite of this variety, the sari is also a curiously unifying garment. It is worn by women all across the Indian subcontinent, representing a dizzying variety of traditions, languages, and religions, and hailing from every level of society. Women from every generation wear the sari on occasions ranging from work to leisure to weddings and other special occasions. It serves them in their roles as business people, lawyers, students, professors, political leaders, musicians, and more. Each woman and each generation have made and continue to remake the sari to match their own vision of style, of fashion, of color, of life and of womanhood. For many, it remains an image of Indian dignity and commands unique recognition and respect. In this episode, I interview a woman who plays an exciting role in helping to develop and share the weaver's traditional craft in modern India. Ahalya, the extraordinary entrepreneur and founder of the unique design house, Kanakavalli, based in Chennai, Tamil Nadu. In this interview, Ahalya takes us on a fascinating journey through the villages and temple towns of South India, where, as she says, every few hundred kilometers, we will discover new approaches to cloth and design, new forms of textile heritage. In a sense, all roads lead to India, and this is also true of the Silk Road, which, at least in one of its iterations, leads deep into the heart of South India, the temple town of Kanchipuram. One of Hinduism's most important sites is also the home of legendary Kanchipuram silk, which is used to make some of the most elegant and luxurious garments in India and the world. Kanjivaram, or Kanchipuram, silk saris. Kanakavalli specializes in these. Cloth has always been deeply symbolic in India. During the colonial period, it was a focal point of mercantilist economics where raw materials such as cotton were exported from India, transformed into cloth on mechanical looms in British cities like Manchester, and sold back to Indians at a much higher price. Cloth ultimately became a major practical and symbolic battleground between Britain and India, with Gandhi forcefully urging Indians to reject imported cloth and suggesting that they spin their own cloth instead. As always, he set the example through his own actions, and the image of Gandhi at his spinning wheel has been immortalized in history. Appropriately, early versions of the modern Indian flag originally included a spinning wheel. This was later transformed into the Ashoka Chakra, a profound philosophical symbol drawn from Buddhism and associated with the legendary Indian emperor Ashoka the Great, who became a Buddhist during his rule. All this history is well known. I would also like to share two less well-known stories, incidents from the life of Indian national poet C. Subramanian Bharati, who also hails from Tamil Nadu and spent a good portion of his life in Chennai during the freedom struggle. These stories are also about cloth. One is tragic, and the other rather comic. The tragedy first. Bharati's father, Chinnasami Ayer, had invested in the cotton trade himself and set up a cotton mill in Etiapuram. He was very successful at first, but, as related by Esvijaya Bharati, Bharati scholar and granddaughter of the poet, Chinnasami Ayer was eventually run out of the business by ruthless British competition. Indeed, 
Chinnasami Iyer was ultimately ruined. The loss of wealth and prestige that resulted from this turn of events destroyed his physical and mental health, and he died. Young poet Bharati was only 16 years old at the time of these incidents. They affected him deeply. My second story is entirely different. Years later, it is the story of poet Bharati's elder daughter, Thangamar, the mother of scholar S. Vijaya Bharati and my grandmother. When Gandhi initially began to advocate homespun cloth to combat British trade in this area as a symbol of the national struggle, Thangamar, filled with national fervor, enthusiastically set up a spinning wheel at home and began to spin. But seeing this, her father, Bharati, provided some unexpected guidance. Your work is not spinning, he told his daughter. It is writing. Writing is our family's work. Tangamar took these words to heart and became a writer herself, writing about her father and also writing her own articles and highly imaginative stories. She did so at a time when women were not encouraged by Indian society, to say the least. But she was her father's daughter and lived by the ideals of feminine leadership and dignity that he passionately espoused. Her own work is a treasure trove, much of which remains to be rediscovered today. In the course of my conversation with Ahalya, she discusses the rising consciousness in India as elsewhere, in a world dominated by inexpensive machine-made goods, of the true value of the skills and craftsmanship of craftspeople and traditional artisans. Ahalya makes an important plea for recognizing this value and doing whatever we can in our various capacities to support their activities. Their work adds immeasurably to the quality of our lives and helps to enrich the world we live in with its beauty. The weaver's art, in particular, has a vital place in the lives of Indians today. It helps to share the richness and beauty of Indian culture worldwide in a uniquely accessible way through the simple, universally relevant, yet infinitely complex means of a bolt of cloth. This seems only fitting for those who, according to one tradition, call themselves the descendants of the Rishi Markandeya, who, legend has it, wove cloth to clothe the gods. Okay, has it switched over to recording? Yes, it has. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ahalya, for agreeing to join me on the podcast. And somehow it's so appropriate that just as we're starting to talk, there's the sound of a beautiful bird calling in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit what the scene is now where you're, you're sitting as you're talking to me? Thank you for having me on this podcast, Mira. My pleasure. Um, I'm actually, uh, we've been invited to showcase at uh, this, uh, it's called the Wedding Collective in Bombay. So actually I'm at home, which is unusual for me at this hour on a weekday. Usually I'd be at work. So the birds are around me, the trees at home. Yes. Lovely. Well, uh, yes. And, and of course, the context in which I invited you on the podcast is uh this uh, wonderful uh, business, although that word doesn't do it justice at all, but this wonderful enterprise that you've started at Kanakavali, which is focused on Indian textile heritage and fashion, uh, saris, jewelry, so many things uh, that you seem to do. So can you tell us a little bit about um, about the store, your background, how you became interested in this and, and what was some of the motivation to start this endeavor? Yeah. So I, I don't think that it was a path that I'd seen for myself. So I can't mm -hmm. say that I followed any to get here. But mm -hmm. I started out with making jewelry when I was, uh, when I, was I guess, in early 20s. And that too was by accident. But during the process of making jewelry and working with a craftsman, I realized there's this wealth of knowledge that you know craftspeople have and expertise that they have. And what fascinated me the most, because they were probably my age at that point, that they were already masters at what they did. And I was just setting out. And that difference was very 
I mean, it was uh, very stark, you know. Mm. So, and it made me wonder that, uh, you know, wouldn't we all be so much more equipped for life if you're, you know, you're ready to start contributing and, you know, you're, you're, you're very skilled by the time you're at that age and your most productive, healthy years you spend contributing to society and, you know, economically to family, community and all of that. So it led me to think about other crafts. And because I was so young and again, dealing with precious jewelry, I adopted the sari as a garment for myself because it I believed it made me look a little older and more serious. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, during that process, because my day would be busy between the workshop and the store, I uh, started wearing the kanjivaram and then stumbled upon the fact that it's a fabric that doesn't crush. It looks very elegant. And you really don't need an extensive wardrobe for you to look uh, you, to look well-dressed all the time. Okay, so let me just jump in for a, a moment there and ask you a, an important but very basic question because many of our listeners won't be from India. And so you say the kanjiram, it's a word that you uh, take for granted in a way. That's true. <laughs> so can you yeah. explain from your perspective for our listeners, what, what is the kanjiram? Yes, so uh, India has a really, really rich history of uh, of hand looms and hand weaving. And uh, mm -hmm. every three hundred kilometers or so, the weave changes depending on depending on, I suppose, usage, customs, uh, tradition, mm -hmm. all of those things. So typically, the the textile is named after the town in which it was woven. So, mm -hmm. for example, the Banaras sari is from Banaras. The Venkat is from Venkat or the Gadwal is from Gadwal. So these are all names of towns, and Kanchipuram is the town, temple town that's in Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. the south of India. And the saris that are made there are called Kanchipuram, and it has a geographical indication as well. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. Yeah. So so and they primarily silk saris. In India, I think there are the two uh, silk centers that really thrived and are called the Queen mm -hmm. of Silks. One in the mm -hmm. south is Kanjivaram and in the north is the Banaras Sari, which should be the equivalent of it. So given their status as premium uh, or luxury uh, garments, it's e it equally appeals to the north and the south of India, either, which, either way. Absolutely. And of course, I was just going to add to the, uh, you know, Indians and many descendants of Indians like myself who are living all around the world. You know, the legend of the Kanjivaram has traveled all over the world with the diaspora, <laughs> of course. Yes, that is true. Um, and I just love your your explanation as well, because you, you highlight so many things in the way that you describe what the Kanjivaram is you know, this idea of place. And I know it's something that I've always marveled at when uh, visiting India myself. Uh, and I've had the privilege of being able to travel in South India quite a bit, you know, between the small towns right. and so on. Yeah. You know, and it's incredible, isn't it? How like within such a small space, there can be so much diversity. You know, you're, Absolutely. you're talking about a few hundred kilometers between towns and all of a sudden we're in a different, in a different cultural environment where the different textile, different patterns, different traditions are emphasized. So that's the yes. beauty of yeah. India. That is true. That is true. Not just yeah. textile, I think craft, jewelry, I think every region had its own, um, you know, distinct, distinctive, uh, probably everything, food, language, mm. costume. Absolutely. And uh, it's so interesting as well that uh, you you brought up the geographical indications. So I, of course, have a background in intellectual property uh, studies right. and a number of the people that I have interviewed on the podcast, uh, several of them also come from that background. But you are someone who doesn't come from a legal background, and yet you're so aware of this issue immediately, you know, with which I think just ties into the link between the kinds of crafts the valuable crafts that you are involved with and this uh, whole sort of legal framework for recognizing and bringing some uh, value in a modern sense to those traditional areas. You know, here's a modern legal framework for recognizing and celebrating, in fact, our cultural heritage. That's true. But as you rightly said, I don't think it's, um, I think there are two things to this. The Kanjivaram has a very... Um, 
has a very special place in people's minds and uh, no amount of you know a gi tag or whatever can influence it <laughs> either way you know badly yeah. or positively yeah. but i think there's i mean the indication is important if it if it's something that can create value for the people who produce it but unfortunately i don't mm-hmm. think we're quite there as a society mm, absolutely so it's there and we celebrate the fact that it's there but what it does for the community of weavers is not something that we can establish right now mm. what is the situation in the community of weavers you know this is as you've been saying it's a traditional craft that we're talking about that's been around in india's case we're talking about hundreds or thousands of years even the culture is so ancient that is true yeah so what is the situation today in the weavers community i think when it comes to craft i think there are two things that are significant when we say culture mm. it's also the mm. the passing on of the skill which was very cultural yeah or uh, traditional and that's a very import, important aspect because there there is this truth to most crafts that you know when you learn it at a very young age you learn it in a very montessori way which means you you actually so get socialized into the craft you don't learn it as something mm-hmm. that's an independent skill as we have modern education do for us so mm-hmm. you learn the aesthetics behind it you learn the pro- you learn problem solving for it you mm-hmm. learn the market values for it so it's a very holistic kind of uh uh, uh education that's passed on that that almost becomes a part of you so you're free to then think out of the box you know and my favorite thing is that mm-hmm. they know the box so well and therefore they can experiment but when you learn it later you're still figuring it out mm-hmm. and the question of experimentation is still very far away because unless you're mm-hmm. you know you're very, you've mastered it you can't really mm-hmm. go beyond it i guess one has to look at this uh you know keeping in perspective so many things india's own history mm-hmm. you know independence and uh you know where we were as a society and mm-hmm. you know when the, when for example more specifically when the when the uh, child labor laws laws came into force it mm-hmm. immediately you know precluded children from learning from you know from their own mm-hmm. parents uncles and things like mm-hmm. that because it was very easily misconstrued as child labor mm-hmm. but the truth is that's how children learn craft you know by by literally you know starting off in the workshop playing with it maybe cleaning the tools getting familiar mm-hmm. with the tools so i think at that point in time maybe there was a lot of breakdown of this transfer of knowledge mm-hmm. and coupled with that you take uh, socio economic conditions um, you know not and this is art it's art of the highest uh highest form i would say mm-hmm. highest form because it's also very technical it's very mathematical yeah. and uh, but if you have no pride in it it doesn't mean that much to you it's like asking somebody who's a very very skilled cook mm-hmm. like you know our grandparents for example i don't think they thought it was a skill at all it was just something you did <laughs> mm-hmm. so i think that is pretty much how most uh, we was viewed it but it's nice that you know that perception is changing but um, yeah i mean we are where we are so one could argue that it's uh, it's a bit late but it is what it is and i believe that you know one should work with what one has and preserve it as best as one can yeah. Yeah, it's very moving to listen to you actually because uh, you know i i don't know much about the textile heritage except as a as an appreciator of it um but i certainly know about the situation in terms of literature and uh and uh, music to an extent as well and i think you know we have to be honest i i i have no hesitation in saying quite directly that i think we are definitely in a position where we have to deal with the legacy of colonialism still today you know that's what i that's what i hear you describing because there's a kind of a a breakdown that occurs right when uh uh you know the india got independence in fact we're we're talking in the latter part of august so it, it seems inevitable that indian independence would be mentioned in our conversation you know <laughs> just celebrated the anniversary last week um but yeah. uh you know there's there's a process of destruction that happened while the the colonial rule was going on you know my my great grandfather mahakavi bharati he talks about the yes. um the onslaught of uh, western imperialism and materialism you know that's the expression he uses and uh then 
you know, the the independence is won and the self-government is there, but so much destruction has happened. And what do you do at that point? You know, we, we have seen that situation in, in relation to Bharati's poetry. Uh, mm-hmm. And of course, you knew my mother as well, and her whole family had been involved. My mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, trying to preserve the poetry and to make it to keep the value and people should recognize the value of that and uh, it's not yeah it's not a self-evident thing how do we value our own language our own culture when we are used to being in an environment where that is not valued and I, i don't think that that decolonization process has happened fully yet i think I think if one were to see the context in which, you know, this breakdown happened, I think mm. it was, I mean, when we got independence, we were a very poor country. So, mm. I and, and a very populous country. And I think there were, and, and skilled, many people were very skilled. So I think the approach might have been our policy making at that time. I'm, I mean, again, I'm not an authority of this. This is mostly my opinion. Yes, absolutely. But I think the focus of the time must have been to provide just work, for people, mm-hmm. you know, and and thing is one of the largest occupations in this country after agriculture, and you know the the promoting of khadi, for example, you know. But, but I think somewhere in that imagery, you know, you have Mahatma Gandhi spinning. Yeah. One, it is for the common man, you know. But Anlu can never be that. It has historically never been that anywhere in the world, but. I think that the imagery of that and then the, the, the fact that there was so much hand leaving still, you know, just made it mm. very complex. So mm. I don't think that perception changed. And I think around that time, there was a fo- lot of focus on industrialization and equipping people for large industries because one assumed mm. that that is a lot of work. Even today, that's why, you know, we want people to come and set up tech companies. We want people to come and set up, you know, factories. And things like that. But the truth is, there was a whole lot of premium skill, you know, there was skill that that could command across the world that was given up in exchange for factory like setups. I think that's where it happened. But a factory like setup was more English, I suppose, or more Western. Yeah. And the yes. sense of being evolved or more educated, if you fell in with that, than if you practiced a skill that we know today is, mm. you know, is way above. And, you know, when, when as a population, we got very confused between being educated and being skilled, and they, they can be mm-hmm. on two different they have parallels. You know, you can be very educated, completely unskilled for anything. Or you can be very mm-hmm. skilled and... <laughs> yes. You know, but also, too, I probably the latter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I think, yeah, so I think that's what happened. And see, policy making, I don't think, has changed much. Uh, for hand loan, like I still deal with mm-hmm. textile as textile, which means that there is a p- large power loom industry. And yes, you can't clothe everyone in hand loom today. It's impossible because there will be that mm-hmm. many weavers in that much time. Unless all of us were happy wearing like one single garment or having 10 saris in your cupboard, <laughs> as most of us aren't. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> So I think that, I mean, again, I want to underscore the, the fact that, the, I, I, you know, Paolo is good, Tanu is good, everything is good. But I think the confusion comes when one passes off one as the other. Hmm. So I think there was this time, I think, post-independence where, you know, the, you know travel started picking up. You know, we had yeah. the rail, we had, we, had, we had roads. So I think at that point in time, or maybe maybe a decade later, stores were set up more as convenience, right? So so aggregator stores. So you get saris from all over, the, all over the country, and we put them in one store, and then people in that area would come and buy according to what they could afford and what they liked. Mm-hmm. But there was no, I don't think the emphasis was on either on showcasing the product or not telling the consumer what they were buying. But I think it very quickly became like a like a commercial war. Like, can I price it less than you? Can I sell it cheaper than you? You said, you know, that's the way I think people wanted to attract more business. And with any business, I guess the focus is on growth. But, you know, your talent doesn't grow like that. It takes a lifetime. So, obviously, it was very difficult. It would have been very difficult to keep pace with 
talented supply, while you could put up stores so much faster because it was possibly an essential effect of how much capital you had. Hmm. So what would you fill those stores with? Uh, you had to get product that possibly wasn't at the highest standard of art. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to sell faster and faster, you had less time to talk to people and tell them what it was that they were being for. But I think in all of that, and yeah, the pattern of all of this is how, I suppose, there was lesser and lesser pride in weaving, mm -hmm. uh, lesser and lesser ability to command a price for the craft as a mm -hmm. skilled artist, and therefore the breakdown. Yeah. I guess we also come from a very commoditized um, frame of mind, right? We always want mm -hmm. to know if this is a necklace, you want to know how much gold, how much diamonds. That's the first <laughs> yes. question. Is a sari you want? Is it pure silk? Is it pure zari? So I'm very particular in the stores, for example. We say, you know, it's first a beautiful sari. And then it happens to be very fine silk and zari. But the truth is that you know, one couldn't sell a hank of silk or a spool of zari to any client. However, fine it is. <laughs> this is eat yes. into something that's and for the consumer. So yeah. then what we're actually trading in is yeah, a very high human talent. Absolutely. In the ability to second like artist. Like, yeah, like, and we've come a long way in the sense that we've been able to differentiate, a, you know, a, a person who cooks in your home from a chef or you know, a painter from an artist or, or any of these things. You know, you know, a pilot from, he was a cab driver. But they were driving you somewhere, you know, I mean, they're getting you someplace. <laughs> but unfortunately, yes. I think for most people also, we were just from one block, just we were, but that's not true. Mm. We were can be very skilled, we were can also be at a very grassroots level. Mm, of course. It's very exciting to to hear you speak about uh, the weaver as an artist and the kanjivaram as a work of art, which it seems so appropriate and so obvious in a way. But uh, it's uh, it's so interesting how you explain the process by which our eyes are gradually starting to be opened to that fact, and the marketplace is also starting to be responsive. You know, because what what I hear you saying is that there's been a lot of development and there is a certain resurgence that's happening at the moment and a new form of recognition and respect and a desire to preserve the the heritage. So can you talk a little bit a little bit more about that? Because you you were starting to say about how the how the tradition of training had sort of broken down. I mean, how has that come? to be revived or how is it getting revived and then also what is it that people are preserving when they preserve uh, this tradition because you talked a little bit about the the manner of weaving but there's so much else as well isn't there there's uh, you know this various symbolism that's incorporated into the saris there's the use of color the even the use of the jerihe the gold thread that you started to talk about or silver thread so how how is all of this starting to build up some momentum so i think um, i think the word has become so global that there's a certain homogeneous kind of a flavor to most things, you know, the same brands, the same, yeah. the same food, the same everything, wherever you go. So at one point, you know, it, it might have Very true. been uh, a source of comfort that even if you explained, there would be this. But in all of that, I think every community worldwide has lost some of its uniqueness. And Very I think so. it's at a point, yeah, where we're beginning mm -hmm. to appreciate that uniqueness and and like they say, I mean, life is about, you know, you have to have enough surprises, but you also have to have enough stability. So I think the, the commonness has become so much that we're now looking for unique experiences and local experiences, you know, whether it's food or whether it's clothing, textile, whatever. So I think that has happened that has uh, re-interested or reignited that interest in people that to be different now, you know, you can't just be the same. So... And I think every human endeavor is to establish identity in some way. And clothing 
to me is possibly one of the most fundamental ways one exhibits it. So at one point, I guess when I was growing up, I don't think at 14 or 15, I thought it's very fashionable to wear a sari. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I see younger kids today who who naturally adopt it when they want to, when they want a special occasion or especially with more and more kids traveling abroad to study. Mm-hmm. I guess clothing is an instant way of connecting back to your roots. Clothing and food, I would say. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so I guess that's why the return to it. And mm-hmm. for me, the return, I mean, to me, I mean, yes, you know, it's always excited me that the whole image of the sari, the jewelry, the flowers, the all of that. But I think it also, I was also very painfully aware that unless, I mean, India has come of age in the sense that we are a very brand conscious market. Yes. And brand has never been built around the craft. You know, it's always been a designer. It's, it's the individual, or it is. It is a he knows the brand is missing on other attributes of that product, but not the craft mm-hmm. itself. So mm-hmm. for me, Kanakwali as a showcase for the Kanjivinam craft was, I think it was the one good I didn't thought that I am not the designer, mm-hmm. but what we're celebrating here is an ancient craft that belongs to all of us. But mm-hmm. and it is a craft there's no getting away from it It can't be for everybody and they can't be for all the time you know we celebrate the garment and it is a special garment it's an expensive garment but if we don't if we think all of that which we do in our heads you know you ask any average indian indian south indian woman or even a north indian woman do you think a kanji varam is then almost 100 percent chance you'll say yes yes but how much should you pay for it is it expensive? I don't, I mean, that I'll be very ambiguous over that. But for me, <laughs> that's what means that even the brand have to be built. People have to see value beyond products. That's when we start to stack it. And then it's cars, you know, it's your next, or oh, that it's, I mean, not all the sides on both things, we don't know But we all think they're great, that's the badge pants. And the car is really, he needs problem user. The old rates of the old rights of extent. But we all believe it has water pun and has to be accessible. And we also think that it will want forever with no help from us. Also, I think we come from a community where we take customization so much for granted. Mm, uh, so true. Like, I still have people who come and ask me, is there only one of the sari that's ever made? Uh, and we, and in another context, in a Western context, we're celebrating, you know, large designer brands that do 10,000 handbags as a limited edition, hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, I mean, when we understand what customization is in the Western context and what it could cost, we fail to see that because it's all around us. Like I tell people, you know, I tell some of my, you know, our, our clients, I say, you know, you, we're so used to, to wake up in the morning and some whoever's making coffee knows how you like it. You know, <laughs> most strong, less strong. Somebody who's weaving flowers on the road, you can tell them, make it closer, make it far apart. Yeah. You can you can customize everything around you. Yeah. Almost. Right? But still, you want to go into like a Starbucks, for example, where you can customize nothing and pay 10 times more for coffee. Mm. But why do we do that? Because there's a certain perception that's built into that experience. And I think it is important. I think it's very important that we, that we build experience and we help people, uh, you know, un, I would say understand. I would help people see the obvious that it's special, yeah. not just know it. Yes, absolutely. I, I was just going to add, you know, because it's so it's so clear to me what you're saying that essentially we need to open our eyes to the experience that's all around us, that in a way we we take it for granted, but it doesn't mean we don't value it and think that it's it's beautiful and even amazing. It's just that we're used to it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If we're used to it, I also believe we've seen it happen. I mean, at least at least until as far as I think my generation, our generation, we've seen it happen. The resume is going to be around, yeah. you know, but we have gotten to a place where people are finding it hard to find, for example, help at home. I don't mm-hmm. think it was even a topic 25 years ago, no. but today it is. People understand that, you know, it, it yeah. is a luxury to have someone cook for you, uh-huh. where yeah. I think it would have been the norm in many, many households. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, another thing, you know, I'm saying is that there are things like food and things like that that you know you could possibly in your house and therefore preserve it. But things like uh, you know weaving is an industry, and we tend to think of it as a cottage craft, and it's not. It's really really large, and there are many many components that make the sari. It's the it's the person who's uh, uh, cultivating the silkworms, for example, in one part of the country. It's somebody who's very in a ET other part of the country and somebody who you know who process there's the yarn, then there's the tire and then there's there's you know so many aspects of weaving and then there's the weaver. But we try to think of it as one case from where the sari comes. You know, it's the weaver, but it's not. So unless it's preserved as as a whole, parts of it can't exist on its own. Absolutely. You know, I mean the weaver has to have the yarn to piece or the zari to 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 weave into it, so the weaver can exist. So so the point I think I'm trying to make is that it's, it's an entire ecosystem, and all of it is supported. And when there are so many premium aspects going into the sari, how can it but be expensive, right? I mean, to put it very plainly, you think if you think of a silk farm, you know, in in the in in fabulous weather in the you know, in the valley in Bangalore, I'm sure the land value has more value than what it could. You know, don't get from selling the silk. <laughs> but if everyone in <laughs> where to think that, then mm. uh, it would be a very different situation and future. Mm. Mm. So I think it would be time to to stop and acknowledge that you know it is special. Yes, it belongs to all of us, but it's not common. Yeah, and it cannot be. You know, it's so. Uh... It's so amazing to me that uh, I started out this conversation by saying I don't know very much about clothing, but I know about literature. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's yeah. astonishing to me how you, you put it so beautifully. And actually, almost the same thing could be said about something like Mahakavi's poetry, you know, because he 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 is known as the Desia Kavi, of course, yes. right? He is yes. the poet of the of the nation, and he wanted his poetry to be available to everybody. He said as readily as a matchbox. Yes. So he wanted, yeah. So he wanted it to be the heritage of everyone, just like you're saying. But at the same time, it is special, and he also wanted that. You know, he has written a wonderful little story about uh, uh, his own experience that he was walking one day in the in the town and he passed a blacksmith shop. And from inside the blacksmith, he could hear the owner was singing. And when he went nearer, he heard that it was his own song, Bharati's song oh, that the lovely. owner of the shop was singing. So, um, but wait, because he stood and listened. And then he, he said, oh, no, it is my song, but he's not singing it correctly. You know, he's making a lot of mistakes, <laughs> wrong words. And so what he did, he went into the store. And you know how the blacksmith had organized everything so neatly inside, all his implements and tools and supplies. So he walked around and just, took things off the shelf and started rearranging everything. Oh. <laughs> so the, the blacksmith came to him and said, hey, crazy fellow, what are you doing in my shop? You are creating disorder. So uh, the poet turned to him and said, yeah, but you're doing the same thing to my song. That's <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Thanks, so. Yeah. Yeah, so just the exactly the same idea that you're describing, you know, it should be, it is the heritage of everyone, but we have to value it as something special also. But I think also value comes from uh, being sensitized, right? Like I remember reading mm, uh, yeah. the real great-grandfather of Mahakavi's uh, poems as a child in school. But the thing is that it's, there's no context that's set at all. It's like museum trips that we do for school, you know, it's more a picnic. You're just yeah. uh, using by the by display. You have no idea why you're there, what you're supposed to take away. There's no context to things. And then how can you value it? Yeah. You know, so yeah. I think textile is much the same. We all grew up. Like when I was maybe 14, 15 and, or 16 and, you know, somebody said, we're going to this wedding and you wear this sari. The first thing was, it was, the one wearing it was an act of rebellion. So it just completely <laughs> wasn't about the sari, you know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It, it became an expression of something else, of of of, uh, of conforming, of uh, mm-hmm. of so many other things that you might not want to do when you're 16 years old. But yeah. at the 
but that means you know the context hasn't been set you don't know why yes. you don't know why it's there. you don't know what it means yes and if you don't know all that that how can you add to it Yes. And and that's also what's so exciting and interesting about some of the things that you're saying, because I get the sense when you talk about the, the idea of building a brand and creating an awareness around uh, the sari in this kind of new way, you know, to me, it's also kind of reimagining the the meaning of wearing that garment, you know, not necessarily rejecting a traditional way, but but taking that traditional way and taking ownership over it, you know, for women I'm talking about and saying, okay, this is the garment that I embrace as part of my beauty, my individuality, my independence as a woman. It is not a garment of uh, secondary status or, you know, oppression or in any way the way things used to be, maybe not so positive for women at one time. Yes, but I also think that uh, in my experience and opinion, I could be wrong, but there are many communities where uh, the, the traditional outfit has become very ceremonial, but not so much here because it's something that you can find every woman from any kind of background in India wearing a sari still. And the variety is again huge. And the variety of what, one, what is the sari? It could be hand woman, it could not be, be printed, it could be so many things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, for those listeners, again, who may not have that much experience of India, you know, I think that's a very important point that you're mentioning. Um, because I can tell you, even speaking for myself, you know, I started wearing the sari when I traveled to India and I used to stay in small towns in South India with my family. And it was traditional and it was a piece of clothing. It was a functional thing that I wore and I was proud to wear it and I enjoyed it, but it was my clothing. It wasn't a ceremonial dress. So I think this family is something we take, uh, we take for granted in India, especially because we still have so much food that's, again, a part of our everyday, right? Your rasam and your sambar. And <laughs> an yes. example I would like to mention is that, you know, when you're unwell, you're really not looking for best of food. You're looking for comforting food. And comfort always has to familiar you know yeah. you're not feeling particularly experimental when you're when you want that and i think the thing is very much also that you know you want that yeah. sense of familiar like even i mean however people see the sari is maybe not now but even like 10 years ago you know as outdated or you mm -hmm. see our heads of wedding saris i mean in first impressions are very important people as much as we <laughs> like it judge everything by the way it looks that's your first impression yeah and i think the sari, for example, is an image of um, stability, trust, mm. uh, familiarity, security. Even today, like like I can quote myself as an example. Yeah, when I was when I go dressed in a sari to an next place, there's a certain impression that you convey, and therefore yeah. the, the the you know you accept a context very differently from when you're in another garment, however beautifully you dress to mm. make Yeah, so I think. Like I said, it's a place that we, we all live with the garment, even the sari. But I don't think what exactly the values of it are, I don't think well, I don't think I, many people are sensitized to that. So for me, since I think of Kanakoli, it was not so much as uh, underlining the beauty of the sari, which I think we all understand, we all agree, we all get. But for me, it was underlining the value of what was on offer. So as a brand, for example, we don't go on annual sales, we don't have discounts. We yeah. have very fair things with we as we uh, mm. we also understand that the that the the consumer of the Kanjiburam today is slightly different from maybe thirty years ago. Context for women have changed. Where they wear the sari has yes. changed, and you were, you talked about color a little bit, and that's where I think we brought in different palettes of color. But at the same time, I like to believe that it's all been sensitively done to not disturb the very you know, provenance of the fabric. And again. I believe that we want a kanji or banaras that we built, whatever, because it is from, it is that. Yeah. But I think the time 25 years ago and the pressure on variety was so heavy on the beaver that mm. I think they saw, you know, a, a inspiration from everywhere. So, for example, mm -hmm. you would have in kanji you would have an organza kanji but those things aren't really, I mean, more like, uh, you know, fast fashion that comes and goes. But mm -hmm. when you're doing <laughs> with weavers, 
you can't think of it as fast fashion. That's where it was also. So I think the, the aspiration or the path that Karan Kali has taken, and I hope you know we will continue on that path, mm-hmm. is to at all times be, be cognizant of the fact that it's the provenance we're celebrating, it's the traditions we're celebrating. So to influence mm-hmm. its very own nature may not be in the best interest of the craft itself. talked about how uh, how innovation emerges naturally from the skill of the weaver you know i thought you put that beautifully and uh, so i think sometimes there's a confusion for people who practice you know traditional art forms like whether it's uh, music or something else where they they feel a need to innovate but what exactly does that mean and i think you put that so beautifully as it's something that emerges naturally out of the curiosity of the weaver when they achieve a very high level of skill it's like for me the way i think about it is that you know i started out with the jewelry but i also had very intense trades in drawing so when I draw, it wasn't something I was aware of at all. So when I draw, I did not realize that I didn't actually draw to scale. You know, so my ability to draw is not a barrier for my mind to express what it likes. But for many people who don't learn drawing or, or and who learn jewelry design as a part of uh, and and on, on the computer, many a time what happens is the skills or what is possible on the computer or the software becomes your limitation. Absolutely. Also, the beauty about most traditional craft is just your mind and your hand is only a tool. And there's no barriers mm-hmm. in express already. Because what your mind can think, your, your hand can express. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I wouldn't have thought it was possible to respect you more, but now I respect you even more because I cannot draw <laughs> to save my life. <laughs> I couldn't uh, speak like you or write like you, I'm sure. So... No, no, I, I, uh, I'm I, just uh, amazed. But uh, it makes total sense what you're saying. And uh, can can I ask you, because you brought up so many interesting points just there, I, I just wanted to take you back to a couple of them. So you, you started to talk several times about um, the kind of rebuilding the the weavers community. So you talked about an ecosystem and how it's necessary to support the different parts. And um, you you contrasted what the weaver does with fast fashion, right? You know, on the, on the other hand, the skill, this kind of skill is a skill that someone develops and, and uses over a lifetime. So, and obviously Kanakavali is involved in this process of rebuilding the sector, if I can call it such. So can can you talk a little about, about how that's happening? Yeah, I think that's, that's too grand. So <laughs> I don't think <laughs> anything as grand as that. And and for me as well, this word revival is so popular, but I wouldn't call us such as revival is grand or anything because I think that at the very basis of it, we're talking about livelihood, right? I mean, we were weaves mm. and that's his profession. And if it's a profession, then he has to command the highest price his talent can possibly command, considering, you know, so many factors. And to me, it was simply obvious that, you know, saying it's beautiful to a bunch of people who already know is like, uh, you know, it's like literally brings me to the choir. But what is more important is to make economic sense to all the stakeholders. You know, the weaver, the zaring maker, the silk maker, and the consumer, and the people who are employed in the business of retail. So to me, as I saw it, the maximum contribution or the maximum impact that I thought I could make was in creating a retail uh, presence that could then respect all that. Because it is obvious to anybody that if there is demand, then the supply makes sense. But if there is supply and there is no demand however mm. beautiful or fabulous it is it's bound to be museumized at some point mm. so for me the point was to create demand to sustain demand to to be the channel that showcases what the weaver makes in a way that it makes sense to the weaver makes sense for the product and it makes sense to the consumer come here experience it and buy it 
So we, I see ourselves as literally between the two. So I know very little about Excel, but I do know that to showcase it in this manner is very important. Like if you see the stores, they consciously kept the interiors. Yes, of course, I mean, it's obviously a luxury setup and things, but there's nothing that's unfamiliar about the luxury that's on offer. There's nothing that challenges your senses because as most Indians, we would have experienced homes like that or, 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 or places like that. And more importantly, I think the textile itself is something that's so familiar that we didn't want to tamper with all those because um, you know, Kanji is, is always at the center of most occasions, at least in the South of India, whether it is uh, an engagement, a wedding, uh, celebrating a pregnancy, housewarming, doesn't matter what. But, and therefore, we also, you automatically take that place where you sort of become a part of someone's journey. So like I have seen clients who come for engagement sari then the wedding sari and they come mm -hmm. back because they're expecting their first child and they're probably moving into their first home so it's almost like a journey you can trace so to me to bring that to bring respect to all of these aspects of retail was my primary objective it's not so much revival or, because i don't think you really need to revive anything that has been marked you know it would be automatic it would be in the interest of anybody in that trade it almost sounds like an educational approach to me. And and I'm just thinking of some of the materials that you share with uh, people who know about the store, you know, like your newsletters and so on. Um, often you, you have a lot of interesting information there. It, this is another thing I was asking you about before is the, actually the culture behind the sari design. You know, that's something you talk quite a bit about in your promotional materials. Um, the kinds of motifs that are used and so on. So, uh, you know, is am I am I right in my understanding that it's almost an educational endeavor at a certain level? Yes, I I think with retail, especially in retail of these kinds of things, I, I think there's also a moral aspect to how you should and should not portray that. Because, like I said, I mean, we're actually showcasing and selling you and that, and it's not just a product. So there is a moral angle in it for me. And I think it's extremely important to then pass that on to the audience. But it's not enough to just talk endlessly about it and, like I said, museumize it or over-academize it. It's very important to also, primarily, I mean, it's an object of desire. You have to want it and like it to be mm. it. <laughs> so I think many boxes need to be ticked off uh, as far as you know the retail aspect. And I believe that's what we've uh, strived to do. There's an education aspect. There's obviously the aspect of beauty. And then there's an aspect of creating the way you experience the product, the service, the ambience. And yeah, so, so yeah, so I think many, many boxes have to be ticked off when somebody says, we keep this alive. Because a viewer doesn't need to be taught how to weave. Who knows? No. <laughs> and no one needs to be taught how to buy a garment that's inexpensive. What is difficult is to is to create that value in someone's mind that yes, this is valuable and this is why it's valuable or not. That's fine too. But the attempt to constantly commoditize uh, a product and to say it can be cheaper, I think that it ever is wrong. Mm. Like for example, everybody, any average Indian would know the price of gold yeah. and no one expects yeah. it to be cheaper 10 years from now than today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like even two months from now. And yeah. you know, no one expects it. It's almost a foolish idea to even propose. But the thing is, it is so with silk. It is so with Zahi. But people automatically assume that the price is and somehow magically sta stable through the years. Or it should be affordable or it should be reasonable. You know, and reasonable is a highly unreasonable on perceptions. Yes, absolutely. So how do you fix that? You fix that only by creating the right showcase, you know, uh, giving out the right information and calling to attention, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's qualities. Like I make jewelry. So I know there's a lot of machine made jewelry today. Not that it's good or bad. But when someone makes machine-made things or somebody creates a, a garment on a power loom and passes it off as handloom or handcrafted, that's the danger. 
it's not in itself. In itself, it has its uses. Like this whole country can't make clothes with hand -made. Everybody can't afford hand making handmade jewelry, right? Because in its very essence, for one, if you want a thin chain and three grams, I don't think anyone can hand make it, right? right? Uh, only a machine can create that. So if that's what you want, that's where to go. But to say that I want the qualities of all of that, but I also want the tag of it being handmade, but I will also only pay that much. I think that's where uh, it all gets confused. And I think that's where trade gets very muddied. And therefore, supply also is money. And as a weaver, why should I slave away for like one more week when when somebody can't tell the difference? And it's not that somebody can't tell this difference. It's somebody who's not been shown the difference. Like interestingly, I think you know when 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 this whole uh, lab made diamonds came into field, the yeah got distributed. I think one question everyone's mind is: and what of real diamonds are people going to stop buying? No. It's just that the, it just makes the natural ones more precious. That's what it does, you know. And I think for too long we've marketed our very precious textile as you know as as products from poor weavers, and no one can buy lab thinking it comes from a poor place. Uh, so I think the the language that we've also spoken um, and. Uh, you know, about the textile, I think all that is also, I mean, going back to a question before, it's all contributed to its, to its uh, shrinking out. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very important to hear you describe that as a moral imperative, you know, because I think, again, the kind of thing you're talking about, uh, differentiating between the mass-produced machine-made goods and the creation of the human, you're what you're talking about, I see that coming up in so many other areas as well. You know, for example, with artificial intelligence now, you know, I live in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, as you know. Right. So here, you know, it's all about the tech and artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, I am neither pro nor against artificial intelligence. It's a new technology. And yeah, when it like correctly. Exactly. But but what uh, has been kind of upsetting me recently <laughs> has been, um, you know, a lot of claims being made by people involved in the AI technology area that, OK, this is going to replace uh, musicians now. It's going to replace writers. It's going to replace uh, artists, painters doing visual art. And I think you just highlight that point so beautifully you know, because there is a difference between the two things, the, the machine creation and the human creation. And the difference isn't necessarily one where you say, okay, everyone should have, you know, the human creation, not the, not the machine. You're right. Everything has its place, but it is the value that we give to the human creativity that we cannot afford to forget. That is true. But then we've learned to give that, that value to things that have been portrayed as such, for example, knives. Mm. You can buy it at every price point, from right down to a few rupees to, I think, you know, to a few wax, depending. You know, it's Japanese and it's handmade and things like that. But it depends on the value and use you have for it in your head. You're not going to buy a knife like that to chop up onions, potentially. Mm. But <laughs> if you have a use for it and you were a connector, if you, if you had you know, if you had party for it, then yes, you would go spend on it. And in your mind, you're not going to be comparing the two because they're not they're not comparable. Basically, they're two different things. It's like I'm comparing apples to oranges. <laughs> but the problem with textile and how it's been sold is that that the difference has never been drawn clearly. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not about the Kalamkari. Kalamkari is the art of uh, hand painting textile uh, with, to be with astral dyes. And it's a very, very labor intensive art. But from the hand painting, you see it progress to something called the pen Kalamkari, where the outline would be painted and then um, uh, drawn, and then it would be filled in, you know, uh, differently. And then you get to mm -hmm. block printing Kalamkari, which is also not easy. Block printing is a, it's, it's also a, you know, yeah. you can take its heights and there are enough examples world over of Indian block prints. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's to not say the block print is bad, but today if you take Kalamkari, which is which is hand painted, and then you have a block printed version, and then now you have a digital print version. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a world they are worlds apart, right? So why can I mean should you also should shouldn't that difference be highlighted? Is the point 
because this is block printed kalamkari and my context is block printing is an imitation of the real thing so for me the value of that is lower but not like not necessary if block printing oh and it could be it is a very premium art form but unfortunately it's used to imitate yeah. another art form yes and that's the danger comes in yeah absolutely so so being able to differentiate and knowing what the difference is amongst all of these different possibilities that's right so to me i think uh you know uh, there is a way to there is a responsibility in retailing craft because mm-hmm. it is essentially like representing an artist only yes there is so much even now that it's easy to think that it's common but it's not mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i i have um i have been listening to you with so much interest i i have to ask you one more question in in this regard maybe shifting the direction just slightly which is um to ask you what it is like i mean you've explained about your background and how you came to to uh, start Kanakavalli and so on. I mean, one thing that also stands out to me about what you're doing is that you are a lady entrepreneur. And what does that mean in India? Are you in a larger community of other women who are also doing entrepreneurship in in fashion or in jewelry or in textiles? Or is this an area where you are a bit of a pioneer? Well, textile, I think, has primarily been dominated by men, at least the details of it, making of it. And I think, I mean, I, you know, I can't part of you know, any community as such. I just started out because mm. I wanted to. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. And, yeah, so I can't say that it was guided in any way. And while, well, yes, it's challenging, but I think that. I think that why I mean you feel chosen the path for example and you recognize that by choosing it you've not chosen other paths and therefore yeah. the paths of some other paths then I think mm-hmm. it would it would be easier to stick to it but I think sometimes mm-hmm. a confused man or woman it comes from for example wanting different aspects of different paths together like for example if I've mm-hmm. chosen to do kanji for a man in a premium space I don't think my aspiration can ever be to be a hundred stores or to one mm. store. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So to me, it's also interesting that, you know, that early on I understood that by choosing where you want to position yourself and what you want to market, you also mm. automatically pick your pace of growth or what it should be. And you also pick the limits of it unless you do other things. Mm-hmm. But commonly what happens is, you know, especially in the world of business, the assumption is that you grow and grow and grow year on your growth you know <laughs> but uh, those assumptions they have to be true for every business they can be they have to be applied differently so i think one yeah i think one thing that's been good about how california has grown is that it's still quite organic it's not been forced there's not been a target that we uh, sort of you know come what we have to do i think when it was more about being staying on that path and doing things that mm-hmm kept us on the path and that was important especially through covid and things like that i think a uh, lot of lot of uh, uh, people in the trade for example shifted focus but this is not something you can shift because this is again your talents and cultivated over yeah. like and you there is no there's no switch on switch off it is what it is and it's even more important to stay on the path it's even more important to create that showcase you know to make it possible to to go on so i would think that entrepreneurship is is wonderful if one doesn't keep changing goals hmm. <laughs> and if one has uh, the pros and cons of the choice that one way makes and then it's the destination hmm. you go to and yes on why one, one go faster there will be roadblocks and you know you turns diverge things and to take cognizance of all that and to keep moving hmm. towards it and not keep shifting focus hmm. i think that i think that is really important hmm. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I understand that there are challenges mm. uh, that women have faced and uh, mm. things like that. But I can't say that I have faced challenges because I've been a woman. No. Mm. 
Yeah, and and uh, it's quite inspiring that you kind of firmed up your determination to continue through the pandemic period and so on, because, you know, as you know, that was a, a catastrophic time for a lot of uh, people in many walks of life. And many different kinds of businesses could not uh, stay the course after that. So that's very, you know, inspiring that you stayed true to your purpose and your vision and you you continue on with that. And uh, absolutely. And maybe to conclude, I can then ask you just a very simple question, which is, can you explain uh, the name that you chose, Kanagwali, what does it mean and, and why did you choose this name for this enterprise? I don't understand. It wasn't a... Uh... It wasn't a name that magically appeared. <laughs> we had a lot of uh, discussions and iterations, and yeah. uh, I like the name Bali very much. Yes. Um, I also used to learn dance when I was very young. Then. And Bali is, is, uh, is a very yeah. famous dancer. And I think yes, my, of course. one of my first impressions of that kind of beauty was actually her seeing her on stage in that kind of when i flowers in the traditional beauty. So one day has been a name that's always been special. And to explain it backwards, I would think that Kanaka means gold, Bali also means yeah. silver, and it also means graceful. So mm. it had the combination of uh, words that was relevant to what we did. So very practical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, quite practical. And also uh, on another practical level, it was a trademark of the name. So that was yeah. important to me as well. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, your discourse at so many levels has highlighted the, uh, you could say, intellectual property or the human capital that you've been discussing that is at the heart of, of everything that you're doing. So that makes a lot of sense. So thank you so much. This has been just fascinating and uh, kind of a window onto the mind of a, a person who has built such an incredible, uh, unique uh, niche, if I can call it that, in the um, you know, in India and in the textile sector in particular, I, I don't know of anyone else like you or of any other store uh, that is quite like Kanakvali. So it's it's quite an experience to hear you talk about it. <laughs> yes, it's, it's just an absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you so much. It's been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much. It means a lot, yes. <laughs>